It is now time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we will begin with topical questions. These will last for up to 15 minutes, and then we will move to deal on with questions that, will, that appear on the oral question list. Question number seven has been withdrawn. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I recently went to visit uh, a business in my constituency called 3M, who raised the issue of ever uh, rising energy costs. Could I ask the Minister um, what is the business regulator doing to uh, try and help businesses who are struggling with energy costs? I call the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, I'm not surprised uh, that Mr. Easton has been asked about the uh, price of energy, particularly for our large energy users, because it's a, a feature that comes up uh, more and more uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, and it's one of the reasons why I asked the utility regulator uh, to look at this very issue. The utility regulator brought forward uh, a paper earlier in this year where he pointed out the fact that we uh, indeed were one of the highest uh, uh, cost areas for electricity uh, in Western Europe. Uh, this, of course, causes me grave concerns, particularly for the manufacturing uh, sector, and therefore I have asked him uh, to do more work on that issue uh, and to come back to me, uh, hopefully, uh, by October. That's the time I asked him to come back to me by, so I'm hopeful that that will come to me in the near future. I call Alex Eason. Um, the, the timetable for this paper to come forward, um, do, you, do you believe that there will be uh, actions that will come forward from that, that paper which could help businesses? Well, I very much hope that that is the case because the regulator, and indeed I met the board uh, of the utility regulator uh, a few months ago, they know where the focus is uh, for me as Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. They know that it's uh, certainly uh, not a good selling point for us to have that level of electricity cost, particularly for the large energy users. Uh, and therefore, I hope that the paper that comes back to me, and I very much do hope that the paper comes back to me in a timely fashion, um, that it will come back with actions and costings, which I think is very important as well, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There's no point in bringing forward uh, pos pos possible actions if uh, there are no costings associated uh, with those actions, because everybody in the Assembly, of course, will want to know what the cost implications are if we take certain actions. So I look forward to the paper and hope that it does have uh, positive actions uh, in it for all of Northern Ireland in terms of energy costs, but in particular uh, in relation to the large energy users. I call Jim Wells. The Minister will be aware of the good news from Kilkeel about the opening of the metal web factory on the old Cunningham Stone site, and she'll also know that the aircraft factory in the town continues to do well and indeed has uh, recently completed the construction of the new Lufthansa first class seat. Uh, will the Minister agree with me that that emphasises the importance of manufacturing in the Northern Ireland economy? And whilst there's been concentration in the construction trade, which accept that the bolstering of manufacturing is the crucial way in which Northern Ireland will get out of its present, present economic situation? Thank the Member for his question, and I do very much welcome uh, the opening of that new factory uh, and uh, indeed join with him in congratulating staff there and indeed uh, BE Aerospace as well, which he has referred to. Uh, I do want to pay tribute to the CEO of BE Aerospace, who has moved on now, uh, and uh, his fabulous work that he did there in Kilkeel, and we wish him well uh, for his new position. But the member is absolutely right that manufacturing uh, is key to the economy of Northern Ireland, and particularly manufacturing exports. And I was pleased to see that uh, manufacturing exports went up 4% in quarter two uh, of this year. Uh, that certainly will help us in relation to our programme for government targets, as he will know. Uh, we have a 20% increase target in there generally, and indeed to new and emerging markets, uh, we have a, a huge target of 60% increase. So we very much welcome the fact that manufacturing export seems to be going in the right direction. I call Jim Wells. Thank the Minister for, for her comments. Um, one of the things that came out of the opening of the Metalweb factory in Kilkeel was quite a worrying indication that there was a, a, a shortage of skilled craftsmen in that particular field, which in this case is moulding uh, aluminium. 
uh, for various uh, manufacturing processes. Will she liaise with the Dep Department, of Enterprise, uh, Department of Employment and Learning to ensure that as the economy does come out of recession, that we don't go back to the situation of, say, six or seven years ago, where there were areas of the economy which were being constricted by the fact that there were insufficient skilled apprentices and skilled craftsmen coming through the system. Uh, Thank the member for those comments and will certainly uh, raise them with uh, the Minister for Employment and Learning. I mean, one of the key elements of having an evolved administration uh, here is to make sure that we do have the joined up government and that we do have the appropriate skills for the job opportunities uh, that present themselves. And that's why we have the Assured Skills uh, Scheme, which has been worked up between uh, the Minister for Employment and Learning and myself. It has worked very well uh, with regards to inward investment, insofar as we can find out what the inward investor needs uh, in terms of skills, and then we can uh, manufacture, for want of a better word, uh, the appropriate skills for him uh, or her indeed. But uh, I think it's interesting that you have mentioned an Indigenous company which has clearly indicated to you that there's a need for uh, skills in this particular area, and I'm sure that the Minister for Employment and Learning will want to take that on board, particularly uh, with his excellent college in that region, to make sure that those are available. I call Maeve McLaughlin. Um, the Minister has indicated that there has been 13,870 jobs promoted throughout this term of the programme for government. Um, can the Minister indicate to this House how many uh, of those jobs promoted were actual new jobs created? Well, certainly in terms of the jobs fund, I have the uh, figures in my head uh, in respect of the jobs fund, and uh, in terms of the number of jobs promoted, I think it's over uh, 7,000, uh, and created is over 3,600. I don't have the foreign direct investment figures uh, in my head at present, but of course I'm happy to write to the uh, member with the appropriate statistics. Um, uh, I just don't have them uh, in my head at present. I call Maeve McLaughlin. I thank the Minister for that and look forward to the detail. Um, can I ask, given uh, particularly INI's um, acceptance uh, a number of months back, that they will begin now to publish the, uh, the statistics around the actual jobs created? Do we have a timeline for when we are likely to see uh, that, that detail in the public domain? I'm very much on record as welcoming uh, Invest Northern Ireland's uh, commitment to provide us with jobs created as opposed to jobs promoted. And the member will know uh, the difficulty in terms of jobs promoted because uh, the number that are given to us by the firm uh, depends on the amount of money they get in terms of selective financial assistance and what have you. And then they will promote those jobs over a period of time, whereas uh, Assembly members, uh, understandably from their own constituencies, will want to know how many actual jobs are created in one particular year. So we will have those on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, as I say, the Jobs Fund uh, have already got those statistics on a rolling basis, uh, and I'm sure we'll have the foreign direct investment statistics uh, at the end of this financial year as well in terms of the created jobs. I call Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what, uh, what progress her department is making with the Department of regional development in relation to seeing changes in the regulations and in the legislation regarding the erection of uh, brown signs, particularly to ensure that we have very soon uh, tourist directional signs for the dark hedges in uh, my constituency. And uh, I want to say to the member that he is uh, very persistent uh, in his uh, campaign to have brown signs uh, for the dark edges, and understandably so. And indeed, many colleagues uh, right across the chamber will want to have brown signs in their constituencies, pointing out particular uh, uh, parts of interest uh, and indeed those recreational areas as well. Uh, I do have to say to the member I have been disappointed with the progress on uh, this policy. Uh, this is a policy which... Uh, in theory, is shared between the Tourist Board and the Department of Regional Development's Road Service. However, Road Service have the final say uh, in terms of whether a, a, a brown sign is erected or not. Uh, the policy, unfortunately, uh, still remains with DRD, and we haven't got the up-to-date policy in place as yet. I call Mervyn Storey. Thank you, and thank the Minister for, for that reply. However, I share her disappointment, and can I also declare an interest as a member of the Dark Hedges Preservation Trust 
uh, will the Minister, along with me, ensure that as far as the uh, DRD Minister is concerned and his department, that every effort is made to have the policy changed so that the many hundreds of people who on a regular basis visit the dark hedges will actually be signposted uh, to what I believe is the most idyllic tree line that we have in Northern Ireland. Indeed, it's the fifth most visited tree line in Europe. And uh, I'm sure he's glad to share that statistic with the House uh, uh, today. Uh, can I say to the member, uh, I had hoped that we would have had a policy by now in relation to brown signs that would have recognised uh, the specific circumstances of Northern Ireland, would have been more flexible. Uh, I understand from road service that they do not want a proliferation of brown signs uh, around Northern Ireland. Uh, when one visits Europe, mainland Europe, you can see why that is the case, because when you go to France or Germany and there's signs everywhere and it's very confusing, uh, I think you will agree for motorists. But I think that a little bit of flexibility in relation to brown signs would be uh, wholeheartedly welcomed uh, by people who are trying to find tourist attractions. And I do hope uh, that we are able to come up with a, a policy uh, which is flexible, which is workable, uh, but which, above all, works for all of our tourists to come to Northern Ireland. I call Rosaline McCorley. Can I ask the Minister, please, if she could outline her priorities for island-wide business development in advance of Michael Noonan's engagement with the CBI on Friday? Um, I am not aware of uh, the event uh, on Friday, which the member refers to. Uh, however, uh, I will say this. We work with Intertrade Ireland, obviously, to increase the trade between both parts of uh, this island, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, because in many instances for small and medium-sized businesses, uh, the other jurisdiction uh, will be the first port of call for their uh, goods, uh, and therefore Intertrade Ireland will continue to work with those small and medium-sized enterprises to make sure that they will have a uh, good support network, uh, have programs available uh, to them that they can work with, uh, and indeed to make the most uh, out of their next door neighbour uh, and to be able to work very well with them. I call Rosaline McCorley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister uh, how does she propose to protect against further marginalisation of our local economy? Well, I don't accept that we are being marginalised. Indeed, uh, just last week I was in South Africa with a trade mission of 27 companies from across uh, Northern Ireland. We were very warmly welcomed. It was a, uh, the focus of the trade mission was in particular for the manufacturing and heavy manufacturing uh, industry from uh, particularly the Mid-Ulster and West Tyrone area. It was a very good uh, trade mission, and I indeed uh, believe that there will be very good orders out of it. So I don't accept we're a marginalised economy at all. We're part of the United Kingdom economy, part of a very stable economy, and I think we will continue to grow as the UK economy continues to grow. I call Declan McAleer. Good last, Ken Collier. Uh, could the Minister tell us what level of marketing support her department has provided to the Explorer Centre in Port of Ferry? I do welcome the uh, question from the member from Strangford, no, sorry, West Tyrone, uh, in relation to the explorers. Uh, I, I, I know you, you would welcome them down there, uh, Mr. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the uh, department, and uh, in particular uh, the tourist board, has been very supportive of the explorers aquarium, as you will know. Uh, uh, it is run by the local council. The local council have taken an economic decision uh, not to continue uh, with Explorers. I know that will be a, of disappointment to the visitors that go to Explorers. I amongst them, it has to be said. And, uh, but that is a financial decision that the council has taken, uh, and I think it has been voted through the council, and that is where it sits. I call Declan McAleer. Does the, does the Minister accept that the Explorers Centre plays a very important role in not only attracting visitors to the area, but also in supporting the local economy? Well, I'm sure all of those points was, uh, were taken into account uh, by the local council when they decided uh, to close the aquarium. Uh, it is, of course, regrettable that the 
a decision has been taken, but I can only assume that they took it for economic reasons and that the aquarium was not uh, able to, in quotes, wash its face anymore. And I do note uh, that one of the local representatives for Strangford has referred to explorers as a fancy play things for anoraks uh, uh, and a constant drain on ratepayers' money. Uh, and now when the local, when the local representative uh, is saying that, uh, about explorers, uh, I have to say it does leave a lot of questions to be answered. And that ends the period of topical questions and we now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. Uh, can I advise members that question number nine has been withdrawn and now I again call Declan McAleer. And question number one. I am concerned that the National Dairy Council campaign is a contravention of the principles of the single market. I believe the campaign is a misuse of the country of origin labelling. It is also my view that it discriminates uh, against consumers in the Republic of Ireland who are being denied both the additional choice and benefits of market dynamics that, that product from Northern Ireland uh, would provide. I have raised the issue with the Irish Competition Authority and with my ministerial counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. I have discussed the negative impact of the campaign with the Agricultural Trust, which includes representatives from the food processing sector, the Irish Farmers Association and the Irish Farmers Journal. And finally, I, along with my colleague Diane Dodds, MEP, have brought the issue to the attention of the European Commission. I am becoming increasingly concerned at feedback from the Northern Ireland uh, dairy processing industry about the adverse impact uh, which the NDC campaign is having on local businesses in over recent weeks. I have written to one of the major multiples in the Republic of Ireland seeking an urgent meeting to discuss this matter. I am aware that the Northern Ireland Dairy Council is threatening to take action uh, in the European courts to stop the NDC campaign and I welcome this approach and will offer support in addressing the anti-competitive stance of this campaign. Both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are exporting regions for food. Neither region, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can afford to be protectionist. If a similar campaign was replicated in Great Britain, which excluded product that was not produced and processed in the UK, it would cause immense problems for the food industry in the Republic of Ireland. I call Declan McAleer. Um, <clears throat> has the Minister engaged directly with the National Dairy Council itself, and would she be minded to raise this at the next North South Ministerial Council meeting? Well, I have already uh, raised it, uh, north, uh, not at the full meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council, but with Simon Coveney, the uh, uh, Minister in Charge of Agriculture in the Republic of Ireland, on, on, on the um, uh, fringes of a North-South Ministerial Council meeting, so he knows uh, my concern in relation to this issue. And I do say to the member, you know, his minister is currently in China promoting food uh, from this region. And here we have uh, the Republic of Ireland denying our dairy producers the right to sell. Uh, and they will, of course, contend that uh, they have a right to sell and the NDC is only uh, a label. But my concern is the fact that uh, retailers are now using that to source milk and thereby stopping uh, our dairy processors. And indeed, one of our dairy processors lo lost very recently. Uh, a very significant contract uh, into the Republic. So it will have an impact uh, here in Northern Ireland. So I will meet whoever I need to meet uh, in relation to this campaign because I believe that it is detrimental for us, but it will also be detrimental for the Republic of Ireland in the wrong run. I call William Irwin. Uh, could I ask the Minister, should we be taking a leaf out of the AFA book and encourage multiples to source only UK product? Well, you know, uh, there is a temptation to go down that line. But I, I do say to the member that we, like the Republic of Ireland, are net exporters. And if we enter into that sort of protectionism, then it will be to the detriment uh, of Northern Ireland, it will be to the detriment of the Republic of Ireland. So we should not go down the road uh, of protectionism. And indeed, uh, I spent some time in South Africa uh, talking to people on behalf of the poultry sector uh, to make sure that South Africa didn't enter into protectionism uh, in terms of chicken products going into South Africa uh, from Northern Ireland. So protectionism, uh, as far as I, I am concerned, does not work. The free market uh, works, uh, and therefore uh, we should at all times hold a light up uh, to protectionism wherever we see it. I call Sean Rogers. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for your answers thus far. And maybe you could elaborate a wee bit more on, on it, Minister, in terms of 
what is the potential loss to the Northern dairy suppliers if the, if the campaign remains unchanged? It is not the potential, if I could say to the members, the actual loss that has occurred already. Uh, and I, I made reference to one of our uh, processors, quite happy to say who it is, Dale Farm has lost uh, a considerable contract uh, in Superquin recently because of the NDC mark. Uh, and that will have an impact uh, in Northern Ireland. And I do think it is a very short-sighted policy. Uh, we are exporting with each other every day of the week, and we do not want to see a tit-for-tat uh, regime uh, emerging uh, to try and deal with the NDC uh, uh, labelling uh, and to, to move away from what should be a single market. And we are told uh, a lot of the time uh, that the Republic of Ireland are good Europeans. It was about time we see them take action on this NDC, and very soon. Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question two, please. Clearly, the global downturn has had a significant impact on Northern Ireland, and local businesses are still feeling the effects of this. However, there are positive signs that the economy has stabilised and that we are starting to move in the right direction. In particular, I welcome the fact that the number of people claiming unemployment benefits has fallen for seven consecutive months, and the economy has added more than 5,000 jobs over the past year. In addition to manufacturing, exports grew by 4% in the second quarter of 2013, and a recent business survey reported that local business activity has grown at its fastest rate in six years. But it is not time for complacency. There is still much work to be done. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive and very encouraging uh, response to the question. Uh, the Minister touched earlier on her trade mission to South Africa, and this is always the bother with having the topical questions before the oral ones. Uh, could I ask uh, the Minister if she could maybe expand on that a bit and maybe tell us why um, she chose uh, that market to travel to? Well, I thank the member for supplementary. South Africa, uh, and sometimes I think people don't realise this, when we talk about the BRICS, uh, we're talking about Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Uh, so South Africa, uh, if you like, uh, is the S on that. And from the point of view of Africa as a whole, South Africa is a very good uh, opening market to go into. And that's certainly been the experience of some of our uh, more established firms that have been there for a number of years. And I'm thinking particularly of Terex Finlay, uh, Sandvig, Terex Powerscreen. And they were all out with us again, along with uh, uh, a number of companies uh, to try and sell their wares at the Bo uh, Bauma, I need to get the pronunciation right, Bauma uh, Africa, which is the large um, show which really showcases the uh, crushing and screening uh, and material handling sector uh, for the whole of Africa. So at that show uh, in Johannesburg, there were people there from all over Africa uh, looking at the wares. And I have to say, I was particularly proud uh, of the Northern Ireland presence uh, at Bauma Africa. When you have companies like PowerScreen, like Edge Innovate, they're doing business right across Africa. I have to say it is a very good uh, feeling to see uh, all of those guys out from uh, West Throne, from Mid Ulster, from right across Northern Ireland doing the business uh, in Africa. And um, as I say, it's something that we should be very proud of. And I'm just reminding the memories from West Road. And <laughs> we also had uh, an IT company out with us. And as I've said before, we had uh, uh, somebody there from the agri-food sector as well. So it was a very good trade mission. Uh, I also took the opportunity to plug Northern Ireland as a tourist destination, yeah, yeah. as you would expect me to do. Uh, and we had a Northern Irish uh, connections reception as well, where we touched base with some people who had left Northern Ireland a considerable uh, number of years ago, but who still wanted to come uh, and listen to the story of, of what Northern Ireland is doing today. So it was a very worthwhile trip. I call Patsy McGlone. I would ask you to call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thanks to the Minister for her responses to date. Um, would the Minister support the establishment of uh, an independent Calman style commission to examine the sorts of powers that could be potentially devolved to this Assembly or, and the Executive to properly and comprehensively address or help address the economic problems that we do face? 
Well, if I can say to the member, I thought that's what the economic pact uh, was doing at uh, present, and he will know that that economic pact will become the focus of attention again before uh, the investment conference on the 10th and 11th of October. Uh, in that pact, we're not just looking at corporation tax, we're looking at a whole range of initiatives that we might take uh, to help the Northern Ireland economy in conjunction with the Westminster uh, uh, government. Uh, I'm one of those enterprise zones, whether they fit into the Northern Ireland uh, scheme of things, how would they work in Northern Ireland, all of those issues will be addressed in the economic pact and we look forward to the update uh, from the Prime Minister when he comes to our conference on the 10th and 11th of October. I call Phil Flanagan. The Alaskan uh, I thank the, the Minister for her answers. Can the Minister outline to the House what the benefits of an enhanced fiscal responsibility um, and fiscal powers for the local executive would have in terms of promoting and, and assisting economic recovery? Well, as I've said, the Economic Pact uh, will be assessing all of those issues and we look forward to what the Prime Minister has to say in relation to the matter. Of course, we still continue to press for the need for the devolution of corporation tax. We believe that that would have a huge impact on the Northern Ireland economy. Uh, there are varying figures out there in terms of the impact it would have uh, on the jobs market. I know certainly that my ministerial colleague in employment and learning has carried forward some works on what would be needed to uh, be achieved in terms of skills if we were to be in receipt uh, of the corporation tax. And I'm also watching very closely uh, what the Labour Party conference are saying about corporation tax, because whatever you might say about the current government, they are on the downward trajectory in terms of corporation tax. I somehow think that that will not be the case uh, if we were to have a Labour government. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I know the Minister will be aware of the importance of new business start-ups in the local economy. Uh, the Northern Ireland figure in 2011 was 3,745, which is less than half of that created in Wales and less than a quarter of that provided in Scotland. Can the Minister tell us what she proposes to improve that business start-up figure? Well, I think as the member knows, there was a difficulty with the uh, small business start-up programme uh, getting it off the ground and there was a legal challenge uh, and that will explain uh, what the difference is in terms of the figures there and we would very much hope that this year he will see uh, a different story in terms of small business start-ups. Uh, what I do want to welcome is the fact that the uh, loan scheme that was introduced on the mainland in terms of start-up loans, uh, I think that's a very welcome uh, additional tool for those people who want to start a business. So not only now have they got the regional start programme, uh, but they can also apply for money uh, from some of the delivery agents that deal with the small business uh, loan scheme, or sorry, the start-up loan scheme. There's so many loan schemes out there now, actually, uh, and indeed, if members would like, I, I can certainly uh, share with them the number uh, of access to finance schemes that we have now, because there's not only the Invest and I uh, access to finance schemes, we also have uh, some mainland schemes which are coming uh, into Northern Ireland as well, and I very much welcome them. And that start-up loan scheme uh, is delivered, uh, one of the delivery agents is the Prince's Trust. Uh, so we welcome all sorts of financial help for those people who want to start up a business, but we do recognise that it's not only about the financial start, they also need advice and assistance, and that's certainly something that Invest and I will endeavour to do. Moving on, I call Basil McRae. Question number three. Uh, I noted the report last week highlighting the drop in revenue within Belfast City Centre. Uh, some of the events which occurred around the protests were clearly a setback to trade in our towns and cities and our reputation uh, abroad, but this is very difficult to accurately quantify. I was pleased to see the evaluation of NITB's Backing Belfast campaign, which had a positive influence on more than 200,000 visitors, and I am encouraged that air passenger traffic between NI and Great Britain has held up in the first half of 2013, and visitor numbers from the Republic of Ireland increased in the first three months of this year compared with the same period in 2012. Nevertheless, I and my executive colleagues remain determined to take full advantage of the opportunities presented to Northern Ireland this year, which include, of course, the successful uh, World Police and Fire Games, the various UK City of Culture events being held in London Derry throughout 2013, the high-profile G8 conference in Fermanagh, and, of course, the upcoming uh, investment conference. I call Basil McRae. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, would the Minister be able to comment on the call made by the CBI yesterday 
uh, when they asked politicians to help retailers by reducing the number of parades and protests in Northern Ireland? I didn't see that call, but what I did see uh, from the CBI uh, and indeed from other traders uh, was the fact that uh, traders and businesses were seriously worried uh, about further street uh, protests and indeed violence. Uh, and I think it was Mr. Coulter, Mr. Ian Coulter, who said that uh, it was having an impact on the livelihoods of citizens uh, right across Northern Ireland. And of course, we should be hugely concerned uh, about those comments coming from uh, eminent people in the business uh, world. However, there are a number of factors uh, at play here. It's not just about, it is in part, uh, about the uh, civil disturbance. I don't want anybody to say that I'm underplaying that. Uh, but it's also, uh, in Belfast in particular, uh, about uh, bus lanes, parking, city centre access, uh, disposable income, uh, all of those other issues. But I would say this uh, to the member and to the whole House. What I would like to see happening in relation to people who, of course, have a right to protest and a right to parade would be that they would have a dialogue with the traders in the city centre and that they would speak uh, to each other about the requirements for each of them because we want trade to take place in Belfast, we want trade to take part in all parts of Northern Ireland, but we also uh, believe that Belfast should be open to everybody and therefore uh, I hope that that dialogue will take place. I call Gregory Campbell. Speaker, um, while all of us want to do what we can to minimise any negative impact on the economy, uh, the Minister alluded in her initial response to uh, other impacts as well as the parades and uh, protests. Can she outline any representations that have been made, for example, on uh, bus lanes and perhaps the uh, economy downturn as well? Well, I did take the opportunity to write recently to the DRD Minister about the use of bus lanes perhaps at the weekends uh, for cars uh, coming into the city centre so that there could be uh, freer access. Uh, I haven't heard back uh, in relation to that proposal yet. I presume uh, Road Service will have to have a look at that uh, to see if it can be practically implicated. Um, but what we do want to ensure, and this is coming through very strongly, uh, particularly in terms of tourism, uh, Belfast is the capital city uh, of our country and therefore it needs to send out a very positive message and of course uh, Titanic Belfast has had a huge role to play in the positivity that we have seen right across the world uh, towards Belfast over this past year as well as all the other events as well of course but I did note uh, from uh, I think it was David Gavigan, uh, the CEO of Titanic Belfast, was commenting that uh, he's ha now having weekly visits from Chinese visitors uh, to Titanic Belfast. So Belfast is open to the rest of the world. We just need to deal with the issues uh, locally uh, and make sure that we do it in a sensitive uh, way to ensure that Belfast is open to every society, uh, including those who have been so upset by the removal of the national flag from Belfast City Hall. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her uh, previous replies. But let's cut to the chase, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's not the problem with bus lanes that is choking trade in Belfast. It's the continuance of parades and demonstrations, flag demonstrations, etc. And could we have a question, please? Uh, would the minister join with me in asking all those involved in demonstrations and flag demonstrations in particular, join with me in asking for a moratorium uh, on any such demonstrations by all parties during the course of the Haas talks so that we can reach a, conclu a successful conclusion and we can rescue rescue Belfast City Centre for the traders and business folk? Well, I note the Secretary of State's comments in relation to his call this morning, and I agree with her. I think it would be detrimental uh, to people's human rights and civil rights to deny them the right to protest. But a right to protest should be exercised responsibly. And what I'm saying today is that I hope that those who organise protests and parades, as they have a right to do, will also recognise the rights of the traders uh, in Belfast City Centre uh, and their need to uh, make a living, uh, to, I'll not use as dramatic a word as him about rescuing, but they need to be able uh, to continue to uh, thrive. Uh, they need to employ people in the city centre, maybe some of the people from the areas that are uh, protesting. And therefore, I hope that there will be a dialogue 
uh, between those people who seek to uh, parade and to protest about issues, which of course they have a right to do. Let's have some dialogue about this so that they understand the position and don't just read about it in, in our newspapers, but actually really understand the issues from each side. Because what I don't want to happen in Belfast is that we send out a message that Belfast is a cold house for those people who want to come in and protest and pray, because it's their city as well, Mr Deputy Speaker, and they have a right to come into that city centre. I call Karen McKevitt. Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question four. The Green Investment Bank has been proactive in Northern Ireland since it was set up. My department through Invest Northern Ireland organised a briefing session along with face-to-face -face meetings for some 40 sector and business leaders earlier this year. In addition, Invest Northern Ireland hosted a series of funding for renewables events across Northern Ireland with 100 company delegates attending and were given information on the Green Investment Bank and key contacts. I met with the CEO in April, as did the First and Deputy First Ministers, and Invest Northern Ireland continues to promote the Green Investment Bank as a potential funding source. I call Karen McKevitt. Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her reply. In regard to the funding uh, opportunities through the Green Bank investment, what recent discussions has the Minister had with the Irish and British governments on the proposed intergovernmental agreement on renewable energy? Uh, an intergovernmental uh, agreement between the UK national government and the uh, Irish government, two sovereign governments. Uh, I have raised issues uh, with our own government uh, in relation to issues around offshore renewables in terms of that issue. Um, uh, but of course we watch with interest and will be copied in on any agreements which the Prime Minister makes with the Taoiseach uh, around those sorts of issues. But the Green Investment Bank uh, has made its first investment, as the member will know, in Northern Ireland, uh, up in London Derry, uh, at the Evermore Energy Plant. Quite a big uh, investment, it has to be said. And I understand there are, there are other local projects uh, being considered uh, for investment as well, including ARC 21 and the North West Region Waste Management Group. So we will continue to highlight the opportunities uh, that there are with the Green Investment Bank uh, and hope that there will be others that will benefit from it as well. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today. Can the Minister advise on what Invest NI are doing to support businesses where banks are reluctant to take risks on such loans? Well, I think it's the uh, job of Invest Northern Ireland to try and plug the gap, if you like, uh, which has been very evident to a lot of our businesses right across Northern Ireland. Um, and that's uh, I made mention earlier of the number of access to finance initiatives which uh, Invest Northern Ireland have been involved with. Uh, and these indeed have been supplemented by, as I said, some of the national schemes. And one of the smaller schemes which Invest Northern Ireland uh, has been involved with is the finance voucher scheme. Uh, and I'm very pleased that 113 vouchers have been issued uh, by Invest Northern Ireland. That allows businesses who maybe don't have the spare capital uh, to, set, to do a business plan for growth or to really set out their agenda for their business. And the finance voucher allows them to instruct somebody to do that and then to pay the money uh, to them. So I think it's, it's a small uh, uh, scheme, but it's a very meaningful scheme for a lot of people because often they don't have the spare cash uh, to set about uh, setting up uh, their business plan or their growth plan for the future. Of course, there's other schemes as well, which the houses are very familiar with, a small business loan fund, uh, the growth loan fund, which continues to do very well, and there are, of course, the equity funds, which are, are there also. So Invest are plugging a gap, uh, which we have identified, and which we hope that gap will get smaller uh, over time, but certainly it's working at present. I call Sam Gardner. Deputy Speaker, uh, can, uh, given this is a £3.8 billion UK wide fund, can the Minister under outline her department's targets for uptakes of opportunities through the Green Investment Bank? Any specific targets for the Green Investment Bank? What I think we need to spend our time doing, and that's what we have been doing, is to look around for projects which can avail uh, of this uh, loan fund. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that the CEO, uh, CEO who is originally from Northern Ireland, which sometimes helps, uh, is, has been very open to discussions with us and uh, we were very pleased to uh, get over the line that very 
first uh, investment by the Green Investment Bank, a very considerable investment. I think uh, the figures are, yes, uh, total investment in the project was £81 million, so an, a not inconsiderable uh, investment to start off with. But as I say, there have been a number of other projects in the pipeline, some which are commercial in confidence, but those other uh, local government uh, initiatives, uh, which I hope will also uh, get funding from the Green Investment Bank. I call Stephen Ngu. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, in her working with local businesses in seeking to avail of the opportunities through the Green Investment Bank, are they finding any barriers to accessing that finance, or to date has the, the, the Minister found that the, the process has been uh, uh, beneficial? Certainly. Uh in working with the Green Investment Bank and their officials and my officials in terms of the Evermore Energy Scheme, they were very open, they were very transparent and very flexible with us, so I found them very easy to deal with in terms of that scheme, and I very much hope that that's the case with other schemes that may come forward as well. I call Rosaline McCorley. Uh, question five. Uh, the executive within the economic strategy recognises the need to ensure balanced sub-regional growth. It seeks to ensure that all sub-regions are able to grow and prosper, and the regional development strategy is a key supporting policy for achieving this. Whilst it is important that companies make their own decision as to where to locate, our regional aid limits currently favour businesses' investment projects locating outside Belfast. I understand that emerging findings from a recent evaluation of selective financial assistance indicates that support has been delivered in a balanced and equitable manner across Northern Ireland. I call Rosalind McCorley. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers up to now. And can I ask the Minister if she could outline, please, what specific consideration has been given to target an investment to areas of high deprivation, such as West Belfast? Well, of course, we have worked uh, long and hard uh, with areas like well, uh, West Belfast. Uh, I see the member for Foyle on his feet as well, and no doubt he's going to ask me something uh, in relation to Foyle. And there are a number of areas around uh, Northern Ireland which do require uh, extra help. But I, as I say, I've been pleased with the uh, general thrust of the evaluation of our main tool to intervene, that is selective financial assistance. And it has highlighted that almost one quarter of uh, SFA jobs promoted were located in 10% of the most deprived uh, neighbourhoods and concluded that SFA had the potential to support job creation in our most deprived areas where rebalancing is essential. And to remind the member, the economic strategy for Northern Ireland is predicated uh, on two pillars. One uh, is rebuilding, which we have been very much involved in through the Jobs Fund and other mechanisms and the second is rebalancing. So rebuilding and rebalancing, those are the twin watchwords of the economic strategy, and certainly that has been my focus uh, over my time uh, since that economic strategy has been put in place. I call Sydney Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Uh, can I ask the Minister what evidence there, there is of financial support by Invest NI uh, for all parts of Northern Ireland to help uh, attract and secure new business? Thank you. I think the, the best way to illustrate it is to look at some of the recent jobs announcements uh, and other announcements indeed so that we have made uh, over this past couple of months. Uh, we have supported firms right across Northern Ireland, uh, and I know members would of course want to hear particular, in particular about their own constituencies, but I think in the spirit of generosity they should accept that we have to go right across Northern Ireland. Uh, we have had uh, a £1.4 million expansion by Macher Lane's Bakery and Macher Felt, uh, Craig Concrete and Tomb Bridge winning uh, £2.4 million of business in Great Britain, uh, a £1 million expansion by Carrick Fergus Base Yellow, uh, Woodland Kitchens in Resharkin securing £2 million of order uh, in Great Britain, uh, FM Environmental uh, in Newry uh, putting in a £750,000 investment, and uh, right across the piece, right down to small companies that are opening up their offices. I had the pleasure of opening up McElwain Security uh, in Five Mile Town recently. One also has to mention their own constituency, of course. And uh, I was very pleased to be at the launch of the £7 million Connected Health Innovation Centre uh, at the University of Ulster in Jordanstown, the first of our competency centres uh, which we have set up. And I look forward to visiting the second of those uh, this week. I call Colm Eastwood. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I didn't think I was going to get in there. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answers? Can I ask her specifically if she's had any conversations with her counterparts in the South around uh, cross-border enterprise zones, given some of the real difficulties that she'll well understand uh, in border areas? Uh, no, I haven't had any uh, discussions in relation to cross-border enterprise zones, uh, particularly with Richard Bruton, he's probably uh, thinking of, but we do continue to have a very good working relationship. I think the first thing we do need to do in relation to enterprise zones is to see how they fit within a Northern Ireland context, and then if the member uh, feels we need to look at uh, going cross-border, uh, or if we, he thinks there are benefits to working uh, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, certainly I'm happy to look at that issue, but I think the first thing to do is to see how they fit uh, within the Northern Ireland context in terms of our policy uh, and our legislation. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment.